The following presentation was recorded live at the Richmond Marriott in Richmond, Virginia for the 29th Annual International Association of Square Dance Callers Convention. This is tape number 12, Voice 2, Improving Vocal Range and Quality. When we uh, see some fresh faces here, always good to see fresh faces. Not that I don't like seeing the old faces. We'll just go ahead and start. This morning we spent some time talking about the importance of aerodynamics, about breath, to get your vocal cords working along. And I introduced you to a, s a concept that's called the breath threshold, that if you can learn what that feels like in your own voice, you can take an, an enormous amount of pressure off of your vocal folds and get to the point where you won't find yourself getting hoarse or tired so readily. <coughs> and I showed you two or three ways in which you could uh, develop that ability. Uh, I'm going to show you one more now just before we get started in today's session. Um, it's called a lip buzz. You've seen it happen before uh, if you've come to the, any sessions that I've done in other uh, ancient caller labs uh, several years back. At any rate, um, your lips are similar to vocal cords except that they're a lot bigger. And so whatever air it's going to take to, to get your lips to vibrate, Will, more th will be more than enough to get your vocal cords to vibrate. So, if you were to start with your lips apart, slightly, and then just blow air, at some point, your lips will start to buzz. I'll demonstrate. Nothing happening. Not enough breath energy. Hit that threshold. I hit the threshold at which there was enough air moving to set your lips into vibration. So, would you all try that? Uh, those of you that didn't get your lips to vibrate, you don't have enough air moving. If you'll move more air, at some point, no matter how fat your lips are, they'll start vibrating. Then the next thing that you want to try to do along that way is to let your vocal cords vibrate. So you get a humming, buzzing quality. It's called motorboating. Right? So if you can teach your throat to go... Just try that. Now, there were, a, there were a variety of responses. Some of you were just gently bemused. Some of you were appalled at being asked to do that in public. But some of you couldn't do it. Some of you went like this. Couldn't get your lips to go anymore. And the, the value of that little exercise is to teach you that as you pass the midway point in your vocal range, you change strategies. And there are lots and lots of people that do that, where they sing very healthily in the low part of their range. They go to the high range and they substitute some other more pressing, pinching, compressed kind of an approach. And if you find, if you suspect that you might be one of those kind of people, this little lit buzz will teach you the truth. And if you do suffer that, tendency, like I just demonstrated, then you have to consciously reinforce the flow of air as you go into the higher part of your voice. Otherwise, whatever it is that's making the tightening, whether it's your lips or your vocal folds, they will, they will step in to compensate for the inadequacy of the air flowing. This is what it should sound like somewhat. Now, mind you, I'm sort of just on the last stages of laryngitis, so one of the places that laryngitis hits is in the top part of a man's voice. So I don't know how high this will go today, but this is what should happen. You could hear that I had to work a little bit to get those high notes off the top, but I, there, there was a spot right halfway up. I'll show it to you. Right there. That if I weren't thinking about it, this would be what had happened. It won't go because right at that point, my vocal, my vocal folds out of old habit clamped down so that then I could push more breath past it and somehow squeeze out the high notes. Any of you ever feel like you have to squeeze out high notes? <laughs> now you're just here to be entertained easily. Nothing at all about whether or not you have trouble with that. Would you do that lip buzz one more time? <laughs> And 
If you get to the point where your lips won't buzz, that's a dead giveaway that you have stopped off the air from flowing. It may not be because your breath isn't willing to deliver. It may be because your vocal folds have clamped down so much that there's, very, there's not enough air getting through them to activate your lips to vibrate. So the solution to that is actually to make your voice more breathy, to make it less tight. So if you do this, ah, stopped because it was already pinched out. But if I go, ah, can you hear a difference in that? Ah, ah, then I get through that little halfway point because there's no pinch anymore. That's an important element, not just for your singing, but leading us away into our discussion about range extension. Raise your hand if you have difficulty uh, singing as high as you want to. Most of you are the men callers. One lady caller that's got her hand up there. Raise your hand if you wish you could get lower notes. One, two, three, four. A couple of folks. The Lord made us to be um, unique and different in many different ways. And one of them is that mo while most of us would wish to have higher notes, there are a few people that just seem to be born with high notes. And those people go through their lives wishing that they could get lower notes. Uh, the truth is that both ranges are available. Believe it or not, it's easier to get high notes than it is to get low notes. I've drawn some diagrams on this, uh, uh, this quasi board here. And I'm going to try to show you some things about how your vocal cords work. If you were to cut my head off, if some of you wanted to do that last year, <laughs> and were to look right down my, my windpipe, you would see my vocal folds at rest open. This should be black, but since I don't have colors to show it with, this would be looking right down towards your lungs, down that opening. That space between the vocal folds has a name. It's called the glottis. You know the thing that's called the epiglottis? The thing that keeps you from choking? It means that it covers the glottis. The opening into the trachea is the glottis. glottis. Anyway, this area marking the edge of the vocal folds shouldn't really be in black, but I, that's all I've got. It really is closer to being white or a light pinkish color. And it is a little wider than what I've pointed sh shown here, but it is the ligamental part of your vocal folds. If you were to think about the elastic band on your underwear, or if you were thinking of a rubber band, you would understand what that ligament is. It's a ligament that comes right up here, just a little bit below the Adam's apple, and it attaches on the inside of the thyroid cartilage. And it runs back here, and it attaches to a cartilage at the back of the throat called the arytenoid cartilages. The, the arytenoid cartilages have some muscles between them, going across actually a whole series of those muscles. And when those muscles flex, you go from at rest position where you're breathing to being ready to start to sing. At which point, the muscles that are between the retinoid cartilages have brought the two retinoid cartilages close together, and as they've come together, the, the rubber bands, the ligaments, attached from the front to the back, are now stretched across and covering the trachea, covering the glottis, the opening into the lungs. In that position, you're now ready to start singing. Where people make some mistakes along the way is that they take these two bands and right back here at this back area of the retinoid cartilages, they really pinch those tightly. I have actually seen pictures of the retinoid cartilages, which I'm going to just try this. My hands now are my vocal folds. And my thumbs represent the retinoid cartilages. And when you're at rest, the, the muscles between the retinoids are at, at relaxation. And when you go to sing, the muscles draw the retinoid cartilages together. And as they're drawn together, the vocal folds are, are swung closed. Well, some people compress their, their retinoid cartilages so much that they actually wrap around each other. There's so much compression, so much strain in the throat that they, they don't just come close to each other. They just bite, they go around each other and wrap tightly. And that can be an enormously 
uh, damaging behavior um, in singing or in public speaking. That would be called a pathology. But you'll notice the way that I've drawn the picture is to leave just a little, little window of opening between the two vocal bands. I'm calling them bands, rubber bands, the vocal ligaments, they're all the same thing. But I, between these two bands, I've left this on purpose to have just a little bit of space between it. Much in the same way that your uh, lips were apart when you did the lip buzz, and then as you brought your breath to it, they finally came into operation. Why have I done that? Be to avoid that, that great tendency to over-compress your voice and to make sure that it's being run on the basis of air and not muscle. Um, when, when the vocal bands are drawn tightly, then they're closed, air comes up underneath, and the first thing that happens is that the vocal folds have to be exploded apart, and it sounds like this. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Would you do that? Just feel it for yourselves. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. That grunting sound, that glottal stroke, is when you close your vocal cords all the way first and then apply breath. Question. This isn't about, is, it being, is it being recorded? No. Is it being recorded? Yes. I don't see a tape in there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, we're running. Okay, that was your question? All right. It's running. The alternative to that, returning to my initial picture, imagine that your vocal folds were not as far wide open as this, but that the gap between them was much wider. And you'd introduced air between it. You'd get something like this. Ah. Ah, ah. You try that, please. Ah, ah, ah. Well, that's certainly a much more comfor comforting feeling, but it's no, of no use to you as a square dance caller. You're going to uh, take a command from a marshmallow like that? <laughs> oh, the man left, if you don't mind. <laughs> if it's all the same to you. <laughs> no, it never will wash. <laughs> there needs to be more command in it than that. And so that breathy quality is not uh, any more desirable than the tight quality. However, there is a space in between, and that is where you bring your vocal folds to that near closure position and then put in process a sufficiency of breath to cause it to vibrate efficiently and promptly, like this. Ah, ah, ah. Would you try that, please? Ah, ah, ah. If you're ever wanting to remind yourselves, just use those three approaches. Ah, 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 kind of a grunting sound, an aspirate sound, ah, oh, and ah. Oh. And what you get on that third one is the ease of the aspirate sound, but with the sound, with the, the clarity that belongs to the other kind. It takes a little cultivation, but by juxtaposing them, saying to yourselves, not this, not that, but that, not that, but that. You can teach yourselves. Those are those two extremes you don't want to go to. Somewhere in the middle is where you want to be. You can really very much self-instruct by just juxtaposing those alternatives and choosing something in between them. And then as you go along, your ability will become more and more refined to find what's called that balanced or flowing phonation. Okay, now, uh, the third picture that I want to show you is a cross-section. Before I leave here, I want to indicate uh, with my pen that in all of this fleshy spot of the vocal folds that are here, there are muscle fibers running from front to back, all embedded inside the flesh. Those muscles are called the muscles of intensity because when they fire, they have a tendency to make a man's voice heavier, to make a woman's voice heavier, slightly more commanding, and generally to make the pitch lower. Those of you who have a greater desire to find low pitches for yourselves probably are among those who don't have complete access, haven't figured out how to access those muscles. Because when they fire, they thicken your vocal folds. And when your vocal folds are thicker, they make a more intense lower sound. Where you get in trouble is when you try to get an intense high sound and cho choose to use those heavy muscles. That's where m many of you men 
will suffer in your inability to find the high part of your voice because they, the shape of your vocal folds is actually different between the high and the low part. I've, I've drawn two pictures here. This is the shape of the vocal folds. The black inside edge represents the ligamental part of the vocal fold that you saw before, and the, f the part behind is fleshy. The shape of the vocal fold actually has, uh, it's a little more sophisticated than what I've drawn, and I'm going to draw an extra layer. This extra layer that's around the edge of your vocal folds is called the mucosal membrane. It's just like skin, only it's the skin like the inside of your mouth. Run your tongue across the inside of your cheek and you'll see that it's, it's moist, it's very soft, slick and smooth. That's the kind of flesh that surrounds your vocal folds. So now, here, we have those muscle fibers that were running from front to back, but are now, if I were to dissect your vocal folds, you'd see them embedded all the way through here in the same way. When those muscles, from front to back, thicken, they shorten, and when they, when they contract, they make the vocal folds shorter and thicker, and the shape of the vocal fold changes to become more squared off instead of pointy. And the vibration pattern changes. In the thickened vocal fold, that's the heavier voice, that's usually the man's voice. That heavier sound produces a sound like a man's voice. If I go into the lighter part of my voice, even though I'm speaking in the lo low part of my range, you might just mistake me on the telephone for a female because even though the pitch is low, the production is in the light part of my voice. And that light part of my voice is has a vocal fold vibration pattern, a shape like that. And so the, when these two things vibrate together, they create a sound that's like this. And it becomes very, very I can't because of my laryngitis, but it goes very... <coughs> <laughs> can't quite go there but anyway it goes way up in there oh there I go I found it way up in there and it can come way down there down low too or I can go into my heavier voice and go way on up as far as I can and then I, and then I can't go any farther because of some swelling that's in my folds but if I were healthy I could go quite a long ways on up just because I've learned how to manage those two things well why all this stuff that I'm telling you because it's this stuff that has to do with uh, the colors, the qualities of your voice, and the range of your voice. And as you learn to, uh, to intermingle those several sounds, you'll end up being able to get a, access to quite a variety of qualities in your voice, and your range will extend on both ends. There is in the human voice two basic qualities. There's a light voice. Oh, I don't even think I'm going to even draw this. There's a light voice and a heavy voice. And so there are two registers, basically. A register is a group of tones that sounds about the same because it's made about the same. And the heavy voice and the light voice are basically the ones. But people who, who cultivate their, their singing voices develop a third register. And that is where both the qualities of the head or the light quality and the chest or the heavy voice are intermingled together. I will see if I can demonstrate that for you. This is my chest voice. Can you hear it rumbling in my chest? You can you know, feel sympathetic vibrations in your own body when I do that. When I go to there, the quality changes, doesn't it? Still me, but it's no longer rumbling so exclusively in my chest. Rather, it's now taking some chesting qualities and mixing it with some heading qualities so that the, if you were to draw a picture about where the vibrations patterns in my body are during in my mixed voice, it takes in some of the lower part of my face and some of the upper part of my chest. <coughs> and then when I go, <clears throat> this can be hard to do. When I go up in my high, high, I can't make it today. Sorry, but up in there, there's no ch chest in there. It's just head, and that has to do with those vibrational shapes that I was just describing to you. The ability of the vocal folds to move from that thick. Uh, vibration pattern where they're thick from top to bottom and the vi vibrations undulate back and forth as you see my hands doing from bottom to top in a rolling motion over a period of time the raising of the pitch the pulling of the vocal ligament stretching of the vocal ligament gradually stretches those vocal cords out 
so they are no longer thick from top to bottom but thin and that there's only the ligamental edge left vibrating. Now, why do I make an issue out of that? Because all of us should learn where that ligamental edge is. Many of you who have approached me in this year and in years past who have trouble uh, getting hoarse will probably find that the reason for that is that you have a tendency to over-compress the, the line between your two vocal folds so that not only do you get the ligamental edges together, the bands, so they're ready to vibrate, but you press so far that the fleshy part of the vocal folds are now starting to vibrate against each other. And that is just like having somebody standing there punching you on the elbow, or punching you on the shoulder 400 times a second. Over a while, it's going to bruise. And over a period of time, it'll swell up and it'll get tired. It's not like it's punching you really hard. It's just vibrating. I mean, maybe that's a better way to say it. If you have a very powerful vibrator and you just stick it on your arm and leave it there for three hours, after a while, it's going to be uncomfortable. It'll start to wear a bruise there and you'll get a little swelling. And that's basically what's happening when you bring your vocal folds too far closed. When the fleshy parts of the, fo of the folds are the ones doing the vibrating and it's no longer the ligament, you start to do yourself hurt. There's another thing that happens as the result of that, which is that you can't find the center of the pitch anymore. I'll, I'll try, since my vocal cords are swollen, it'll be easy for me to demonstrate. The swelling in my vocal folds leaves me able to get the access, the ligament, down in the low to medium part of my voice. But as I start going higher, I can't, I can't get away from that thickness in my cords, and therefore I can't get the top of my voice. In essence, that's what happens to you when you get laryngitis, is that you can't, can't stretch your ligament uh, anymore, so you can't change any pitch, and you end up with that sort of dull, monotonish quality, and that's when flesh is, is batting against flesh. But uh, as I try to find that breath threshold, ha, ah, ha, ah, ah, ha, ah, ha, right there, that's the ligamental part of my voice vibrating. Ah, you can hear it's very easy to tell where the center of that tone is. If I'm going to sing an actual pitch, ah, it's very easy to tell where that pitch is. Now, if I do it the other way, ah, you know how it's hard to tell where the center of that pitch is? It's thicker. <clears throat> you must have had a really good lunch, oh. <laughs> Starting to droop. Anyway, that's an important thing for me to say to you. So now, with all that behind you, how do you do something about it? The first thing that you do is try to find that gentle phonation pattern in your voice. So would you join me at that? Ah, ah, ah. With the ease that that represents, I want you to glide from range to range. I'll do it for you first, and then I want you to join me. So here's the first part. Ah, ah, ah. All you're trying to do is to hold on to that feeling. Ah, 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 ah. And all you're doing in, so in, in that little exercise is stretching the ligamental line of your voice. The vocal ligament's like a rubber band. I won't go into the details of how you do it. Just let me say that as you raise pitch, the ligament gets longer, maybe as much as 50% longer than its at rest position. So if, if, if the man's vocal folds were as long as my thumbnail, it would like, be like me growing out my thumbnail half again as long. And that gives you quite a, a, a change, a range of pitch that's available to you. But along the way, that's all that should happen. The, the ligament should stretch. You shouldn't medial compress. You shouldn't push your voice. You shouldn't try to thicken it or anything. Just stretch it. So if you're looking to, for some way before you go to a dance to warm your voice up, this is one of the things that you should do. It's sort of like uh, stretching out your Achilles tendons before you go run a marathon. If you don't do it, you're, you'll find yourself not being able to reach the high notes. The stretch in the ligament is an important thing that you need to try to practice. Some people come by this more readily than others. Some people don't have any trouble with this all. Other people do and have to work at it. So here we go again. Here's the pitch we're going to start with. There's the pitch we're going to end with. Uh, there, ah, please. Ah. If, you, if you have really hit your breath threshold, you will have no difficulty making that transition. One more time, each of you. Ah. 
And again. Okay, what I'm hearing is that some of you halfway through that lift kind of flip like this. Ah, and all of a sudden the quality doesn't gradually shift, it jerks. Um, stand up here just for a second. Shake hands with me. Let's see, with Jeff. Okay, now Jeff represents the muscle that stretches the vocal ligament long. So you pull on me, and I'm the muscle that represents the heavier quality of the voice. And so I, when I want the vocal folds shorter and thicker, I pull. And Jeff has to give ground. But then when, when Jeff wants the pitch to raise and I don't want to let go, we get a stalemate and the pitch doesn't rise. Or sometimes what happens is that I just say, okay, you can have it. <laughs> See what happened to us? Those of you that are going, ah, and flipping across, that's in essence what's happening, is that you haven't developed the ability to glide between those, and therefore you get a little instability between those transitions. And if I know all you men, nobody likes to show in public any degree of instability. Right? Stoic, always in control. You hit that fragile part of your voice, and so you say, no, nah, that's too high for me. I find it, pitch it lower, turn the speed down, find another song. Stay away from that little vulnerable spot in your voice. But all the ladies in the crowd that are used to being in touch with their vulnerable side don't have any, ten, any problems that way at all, do you? <laughs> so try it again. Now that you know what's going on, when you hit that little slippy, slidey place where uh, you just hit a banana peel and slipped about a half of an octave, purposefully slow it down. I'll demonstrate. Uh, 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 hmm, that didn't sound very even to you, to me, did it? To you? No. So instead, I would go. Uh, uh, right at the point where I feel it wanting to get away from me and slide over to the other side, I purposefully slow it down and make sure that I touch every microtone along the way. Would you join with me? Uh, you guys chickened out too soon. <coughs> I don't think I'll be able to do that too many more times today. Let's go again. I'm going to take you from there to there. Okay? So here's your starting pitch, and there's the ending pitch. <laughs> Some of you didn't want to go there. Sounded a little bit like a drone. I can't go any higher. Yeah, you can. Just keep on your breath threshold and stretch. Literally, that's what's going on. You're stretching the ligament on the inside edge of your vocal folds. Again, I don't have very much voice. And this is now getting into the range that I can't do very well, but I think I can demonstrate it enough so that you can hear it. From there, uh, right there, you could hear it starting to happen before it cut out on me. Uh, and then at that point, I can't thin anymore. You guys can, because you're not sick. So here you go. Uh, there you go. And lo and behold, once you get there, you say, gee, that's not very hard. As long as nobody, nobody begins to question my gender, I, I, there's no problem with that. I can do that anytime I want to. So do it again. Now this place where you are right now, that's the mixed part of your voice. That's where you've got both the light quality and the heavy quality mixed together. So start right there, go back up, come to center, take a good breath, start there, go to the bottom, and come back up again, okay? So here you go. Uh, take a new breath. Uh, so you just learned a principle that uh, trained singers have known for many, many years. And that is, if you want a wide access to your voice range, that the, the best place for you to be is in the mixed quality voice, not in the heavy voice. 
Unfortunately, for most square dance callers, where testosterone is required, you want that heavy, commanding voice. And so you choose your chest quality. Well, the chest quality and the head quality don't mix very well together, and you get that big breaking point in between them. The better place to be would be to find that mixing quality and learn to carry it low and carry it high, and then you would not have those breaking over points. Does that make any sense to you? Can you understand that as, you, as you've sensed it? You just felt it in your own bodies. Now, ladies, let's get a little response from you. Were you able to do, successfully do this exercise? I found if I opened my mouth wider as I wanted to go up. Yes. Now, that, that's a really peculiar little notion, isn't it? What does your mouth have to do with it anyway? It actually has some to do with it. Uh, because what's really happening as the air comes up out of your lungs, right at the point of the vocal folds, there is a little piece of magic that happens. It's kind of God-given magic where aerodynamic energy suddenly changes into acoustical energy because of the vibration pattern in the vocal folds. And depending on how efficiently that is done, it is possible for a person to sing full bore volume, hold a candle right in front of his mouth, and have the flame not flicker in the slightest, even though he's using tons of wind to generate that. Why? Because at the vocal folds, that stream of air is broken up into little choppy wavelengths of, of um, molecule pressure. And that is now, we, our ears receive that as sound, as acoustical energy, rather than just wind energy, aerodynamic energy. And so th if that transfer is done really well, then you're okay. But it's still carried in the air. It still has to get out of your mouth. The sound is made down in your throat. If, however, your tongue is in the wrong place, or if your mouth is too far closed, then it will be like singing into a cup. I don't know if you've ever tried to do that. If you put a glass over your mouth and go, oh, you can make about a half second worth of sound, and then until the air can move, you know, you've filled up the cup, there's no more room for air pressure. Until air moves again, you don't get any sound. Take the cup off, sound flows again. Well, if your mouth's closed up, or if your tongue's in the wrong place and blocking the exit of that sound coming out of your throat, then you can't sing. And so sometimes opening your mouth will get the obstruction out of the way so that at least the air can get out. Many voice teachers will teach you to open up your mouth more, and there are some reasons for that. Listen to this. Uh, same vowel, changed, right? Because there is a, um, a space, about seven and a half inches for a grown male, from the top of your larynx to the tip of your lips, and it's in that space that we create vowels, that we create bright sounds and rich sounds and dark sounds. Now, that already starts right how your vocal folds vibrate, but how we shape our mouths and the upper part of our throats is the big deal here. Boy, you guys are suffering. You want to stand up for a second? You just all had lunch. You're all falling asleep. My wife does this to me all the time. I'll start talking and she'll fall asleep on me. And <laughs> I get real self-conscious about that. But nevertheless, stand up, awaken yourself just a little bit. Yeah. Oh, you're just stretching. Yeah. Okay, go ahead and have a seat. Yes, comment, question. Where does the falsetto fit into all of this? <coughs> when, when a person sings in falsetto... I'll, I'll, re, I'll put this picture back up. The middle picture. You'll see that there is a, an opening here between the two vocal ligaments. When you sing in real voice, um, that space is closed. And what I've been teaching you today is that that space closes not because you press it closed, but because there is sufficient air suction to draw it into a closed position, and you don't get any wasted breath. On a falsetto, however, 
that gap is a little wider and the, the vocal folds never close all the way. And so there is a little bit of a change in quality. It's absolutely only the ligament vibrating. So, <clears throat> there it is. That's a falsetto for a man, <laughs> for a normal man. <laughs> that's, that's, that's about all I can give you today. But that, that little ligamental edge has a very sweet, quasi-feminine quality to it. And that's all it is, is just the little, little ligamental edge. So a yodeler who goes from there to there can, by just very subtly playing with the opening and clo closing of his vocal folds and becoming adept at it, can flip those registers instead of joining them and get adept that he can find pitches here and pitches there. Now, there are lady yodelers, too, and that's a really interesting thing because lady yodelers, the common belief is that ladies don't have a falsetto. Well, they have a, a real head voice that's hard to tell the difference between, but they also have that heavier voice. And those ladies know how to flip those registers instead of blending them and do so in such a way so that when they're on the upper note, it's in tune, and when they're on the bottom note, it's in tune. And they get really adept at that. And it's quite a magical little experience. And get, those of you that are going to go to the yodeling session this afternoon will get a little sense of that. But for a man, the essential element of yodeling is to be able to find that falsetto. And the falsetto is that light voice left unclosed. This, you can hear the, the air leaking on me just because of the swelling. But there are some falsettists who are so good that you can't hear any any breath leaking at all. It's really clean and clear. Some people have no vibrato. Some have a, a, a lot. What is vibrato and what, um, what happens to the voice when it's happening? Thank you. There are several causes of vibrato. And just let me see a show of hands. How many of you think vibrato is a good thing? Vibrato is an undulation of pitch, a shake that or that or that different speeds different widths and so forth um, good thing or bad thing I believe it's a good thing I think it's a spice that you can use like other tools yeah I think yeah I think I think it's a bad thing I, th I think I like a smooth voice yeah you want a straight a straight voice right Yes. No, um, not everybody can have it. It is uh, it, when it first developed. It was an ornament. It was something to use uh, at the end of tones. You still hear it in popular music where they'll sing, oh, sing straight and let the vibrato come in right on at the end to warm the tone. And that's generally what is said. That a tone that has vibrato in it is a warmer tone than a straight tone. Um, and so. <coughs> There are a variety of causes of vibrato. I'm going to tell you the ones that are not good. One, one kind of vibrato is where the breathing system is so stiff that you can see the body torso shake right in the same speed as the vibrato. That's not very good. Then, uh, because it's so slow and it's so wide and it's so bothersome. Then there is the fast kind of bleating vibrato that is often the character of some female singers. And, and it's kind of, the French call it um, voce di capra or uh, goat's voice because it <laughs> kind of bleats. And that's done by taking the strap muscles just above the larynx, particularly the tongue, and uh, learning right at the base of it to waggle the, you know, flex it and release it. It's uh, if you if you've seen violinists, they'll their hands will shake on the violin string to get a little bit of sweetness to come into the sound, and that's basically what p these people do with the base of their tongues. Sometimes that gets out of control. So you you see somebody singing ah, and their jaw is waggling or their tongue is moving around in their mouth. You usually don't see that except in opera singers who are not singing very well. But there, there's an, an awful lot of manufactured vibrato, and I don't think that's a very good plan at all. Does everyone have a falsetto? Um, all males have a falsetto. 
All females at one point in their life had a falsetto and have now long since forgotten how to do it, and now it's their normal speaking voice. How can, <laughs> how can you get into your falsetto easily? Well, you just remember before puberty. <laughs> well, I don't seem to be able to do that anymore. Uh, no, no, actually... The truth is, is that uh, I was halfway tempted when we were doing that gliding thing to have you stand up and say, now here's a guy who can still find his falsetto. <laughs> Moi? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll have that little exercise here when we get done talking about vibrato. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Now, there, there are some, there is a good kind of vibrato. I would like you to answer a question while you're doing this. Something you're doing happens to all of us. You get up there, you start calling, and you want to cough, or your throat is tickling. Now, you said that the vocal cords, nothing that we drink, nothing we do is going to help the vocal cord. What is causing you to cough, and do you normally do anything when you're coughing to help that fact that you get a tickle in your throat and you're coughing? I have um, I've got some uh, infection down in my, my bronchial tubes and just below my vocal folds, um, and... And so that mucus builds up, and when the air goes in and out, it rattles, it, and it tickles. And I can tell that it's built up there, and it makes me want to cough it out. It's the same thing that anybody that has a coughing spasm feels. And I shouldn't cough, but I do anyway. What I should do when that comes is this. <coughs> oh, that was a whole lot better. But, but just by vigorously blowing air... <coughs> I can I can break that loose, where that's not nor not my normal habit. Before I knew any better, I learned to cough. What about throat tablets? Throat tablets, by the same token, will not get down and touch those things. And if they do, you're not going to like it very much. Mostly, what throat tablets do, particularly lozenges that have an, an, an analgesic in it, a deadener, they will deaden the sensations in the back of your throat. We have lots of nerve endings in the back of our throat. That little uvula that hangs down at the back of your throat is really put there as an advanced warning system saying, food's coming, epiglottis go down. You know, I, something just went by me. It's going to be at you any second now. You better get ready or else it's going to go down the wrong opening. All of those nerve endings are part of the swallowing process to help our body prepare for swallowing. But when we, when we get a, a sore throat, Generally speaking, it's in that upper oral pharyngeal range that is um, very sensitive. And so it gets very raw, and we feel like, oh, I've got such a sore throat, I can't sing. Well, my voice still works, but oh, I've got such a sore throat, I can't sing. And the truth is, you can sing. When, it's that, when you've got that soreness up above, where it just feels raw, if you can go, oh, you can sing. You don't have too much swelling in your vocal cords. If, however, you get, oh, then you better not sing because you don't have the stretch. You can't get the ligament to stretch through the pitches you need to go to. That's a time when somebody asked me earlier, what do you do when you have that? Well, you do a whole bunch of patter calls. You don't, you can't use the inflection on your voice, so you, there's no point in trying. It won't help you. You can't force it. You, yes, yes, it can damage it. I have found that sometimes when you... You have a, when you have a little bit of laryngitis or something, at times it's easier to hit high notes clearer than you can hit the low notes. And again, when the laryngitis is coming on you, it sounds like he's changing to a bass singer, and your voice is still clear, but it has that bass tone. What's the difference there? Some people have their voices built from the top down, e easy to access high notes, but hard to access low notes. And... There are others, the vast majority of men, is that the, you have access to low notes and have to pray for high notes. Whenever you get sick, the weakest part of your voice is the first to go away. So for men, it's usually the top voice. Or if you happen to be a man with a very high voice, that gets stronger, and the lower you go, the more uh, vulnerable you get. Same thing for women, depending on whichever way it's gone. This is the first side of your cassette. Hello who has access to the high part of his voice, that little bit of extra edema, that little extra swelling, adds greater thickness to your vocal folds, 
not to the point where you can't talk, but just enough so that it enriches your voice and makes it feel a little more bassy. I have seen the times when it would a cold or laryngitis would start, and I would just like to stop it at that point and just uh, it sound better to me than it did normally. Yeah, just say right on the verge of being sick your whole life, and you'd be in good shape, wouldn't you? First of all, I want I want you to finish that question about the good vibrato. Second of all, if I'm cheering at a Yankee game and and I lose my voice, I lose my speaking voice, but I can still sing. Why is that? That again is that same situation where. If you're a person who has better access to the high part of your voice than the low part of your voice, and you've damaged it, you, you can't access the thick part, but the ligament will still be there. I've known women, literally, women who were totally laryngitic and talking, walk out on the operatic stage, sing across a 100-piece orchestra for three hours, do great, come back into the dressing room and not be able to say a word. But that's because they have access to that ligament, and they don't over compress their voices. But when they speak, they speak down in that lower range, and they, it's the weak part of their voice, and so it won't work for them anymore. <coughs> Back to the vibrato. There are, when you, whenever you flex a muscle in your body, the brain wave that sends that command isn't a steady stream of information, but comes in pulsations. And that pulsation, uh, many people, neurologists, think that that's where the origins of the real, natural, appropriate vibrato comes from. Now, those, those neuro, neurological firings happen at different frequencies and actually can be trained. And the current theory is that it isn't just that the brain is sending command to the muscle to fire, but the muscle is also sending command back up to the brain about how the firing is doing. So there's a kind of a back and forthing of information. And it's that backing and forthing, that cyclical thing that sets up the flex release, flex release, that changes vibrato. Vibrato is an undulation, a slight variance in pitch, a slight variance in volume, it gets a little louder and a little quieter, and it's also measured in how many times per second it happens. Those are the parameters that define vibrato. There is a muscle which I haven't talked to you about. It's the muscle that stretches your vocal ligament. The muscle's name is the cricothyroid muscle. And when it stretches the vocal ligament, the pitch goes up. And when it relaxes, then the ligament contracts and the pitch goes down. Only it does so in a very subtle way so that the variance in pitch is only about a quarter of a pitch, uh, an eighth above, an eighth below. When it gets to be more than that, we start to get bothered because we no longer can tell what the real pitch is supposed to be because it's starting to intrude into the place of the next half steps above and below. And we like a, we like a vibrato speed that's somewhere in the neighborhood of six to six and a half, although people's vibrato ranges actually go from about four to seven and a half. And the people that are up on the seven and a half side, we don't like very much because they sound so fast and so tweety. And the ones that are really slow, we don't like because they sound so lumbering and uh, awkward. And any time a vibrato draws attention to itself, you've got a problem on your hands. But when vibrato is a background quality issue, then it's a, usually considered to be very desirable. How many of you have... Uh, and so, getting back to this, the best thing you can do to help a vibrato happen is to not do anything. All of you, take your thumb and put it right at the base of your tongue. You need to get to know your own physiology a little bit. You hear your chin, and right underneath that double chin is a muscle. You can palpitate it. It's your tongue, the base side of your tongue. Okay? There's a, one part of that tongue runs from your chin right down to a little bone that you can hardly feel because it's so surrounded by, by muscular fiber. Right there, I want you to all try something. I'm going to sing this scale, and then I want you to sing it after me. Oh, you do that. If you felt some change in the tension level of that muscle, then you're not changing pitches as well as you should. You, you substituted an alternate way of pitch change. Instead, the pitch should actually change based upon this little muscle that I mentioned to you a moment ago, the cricothyroid muscle, which is embedded right down inside your larynx. I don't know, this is going to be a little harder for you to do. Men, you'll find an easier time of this. Women will have a hard, harder time. Can you find your Adam's apple, gentlemen? You'll recognize it because it sticks out and it has a little notch in it. That's the top of your thyroid cartilage. Now come running down the face of your thyroid cartilage about a half an inch down from there and you'll feel a little dividing line. 
and then there's another cartilage that happens below that. Right? That's the cricoid cartilage. Your vocal folds are actually embedded underneath the thyroid cartilage, about about a, oh, an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch down from that notch. So that's where your vocal folds are actually located. Now find that little notch, the little groove between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage. And just put your fingernail in between those. It may, may, you may not like it very much. I don't like it very much because that's right where my laryngitis is. But then, as you go, ah, you should feel that notch disappear, pinched together. That's the action of the cricothyroid muscle at its best. Now, how many of you felt that happen? How, how many felt the, those spaces diminish? All right, that's the way pitch is supposed to change. How many of you felt this muscle under your tongue tighten as you went up your scale? Raise your hand. A couple of you did? Good. That's actually unusual. Most of the time, there's a lot of trouble with that, that people have substituted that means of pitch, pitch changing, and that's a dead certain way to limit how high your scale can go. Yes, sir? Say something about hitting the high notes with your head up like this and the low notes with your head going down. That just gives another new meaning to choreography. <laughs> you actually should not have to change your position at all. Frequently, pop singers who use this, this muscle, I think it's called the genuohyoid muscle. And what they do is that they, they tighten that muscle, and as they do so, they, you, they yank on the thyroid cartilage, as the thyroid cartilage is stretched out of position, the, the vocal ligament gets stretched and you can make some pitch change. It's kind of artificial way to do it, but it can happen. But when you get to a certain pitch range, this tongue muscle is already stretched as tight as it's going to go. So if you need more pitch beyond that, the way you do it is you thrust your chin out like that, and if that muscle stays tight, it'll yank that thyroid cartilage into a new position and you'll get higher notes. It won't be very good on your voice, but lot, lots of rock and rollers do that. Lots of people. And you can almost tell for sure because they have a, they have a posture that looks something like this with the lower chin thrust out and their head raised. And it's, if you were to grab a hold of them underneath their throat, you'd feel that that muscle was so tight it would feel like a bone, so, so drawn tightly. And by the same token, in order to get the low note, they got to let go of that tightness. So by dropping your chin down, it reduces the, the pull on the thyroid cartilage and you can get a lower note. But it's not the right way to do it. Now, we didn't finish with the vibrato quite yet. <laughs> Keep zipping off in around. Vibrato is really a function of how intensely you sing. The brain says to the, the thyroid cartilage, excuse me, it says to the cricothyroid muscle, it's flex, I want a certain pitch. And if there's no intensity to the sound, if it's a light sound, that muscle has no trouble complying. But if it's a fairly intense sound where it has to kind of work in tandem with these heavier muscles, the, the muscles that make your throat thick, then there's a greater workload that it's put under. At that point, the need for... Uh, every time you... Mm, let me back up a step. Everybody take... Take your fist, and I'm going to teach you something about blood flow. Just flex it, pull it really tight, and hold it there to, for the count of about 20. As you go along, I, I used to get bored at church, and I'd, I'd sit there and I'd take all the blood out of my fingers and hand and create paralysis from my hands. Better listening to the sermons. <laughs> I'm better than that now, but that's where I learned how to do this. Okay, that's about 20. Now, now, let go. You feel the warm tingle come back in? You know what that is? That's blood flowing again. When a muscle flexes really tightly, it restricts the, the blood flow through uh, the, the cells that are in the muscle. And so the muscle is given a command to work, and in the process of working, it um, oxidizes. It, it gets uh, acid built up in it, and it lacks oxy oxygen. So there's a great need for that muscle to release so that blood can flow down into the capillary level to carry away the acids and to bring oxygen in its place. 
And so what really is the best de definition that I have for what a vibrato is, is that that, that that thing that we can't see, that flexing and releasing that we can't see in the big muscles in our arms and our legs, they, that happens down on the vocal fold level where you've got very thin, very small, fine muscles, and you can actually see or feel here the consequence of that flex and release as the pitch rises and falls and rises and falls in very subtle ways. And it's an essential element and, uh, for the health of the vocal folds and the flesh in the vocal folds. If, however, <coughs> somebody is singing more intensely, louder, more dramatically, you would expect that the vibrato would be more prominent because the, the amount of work being done is greater and the amount of release, the difference between those is greater. But in a place where there's no intensity required, you have no need for, for vibrato because the blood can flow through at, at regular speed. So vibrato is really a variable element depending on whether or not you're trying to create a, a degree of intensity or trying to get rid of the intensity. There was a hand back in here and I didn't catch it. Does this uh, vibration of a muscle because of the lack of oxygen maybe explain why when we exercise or do some rigorous physical activity that after a while you, you start to shake? Yes. Yes, you see that more regularly if you're trying to lift, lift a heavy object and you, you've gotten to the point where the muscles are really at their maximum contraction and, and they have great need for release. In work that doesn't put it all the way out to the extremity, not every fiber in the muscle fires at once. They, f they sort of fire in random patterns. And so you don't see the muscles twitching. But when a, a muscle is brought to its maximum activity where every fiber in it is flexed, then the need for reoxygenation becomes critical and then you'll see that quivering as the muscle releases and fires and releases and fires. And that's kind of what happens with some singers. Some singers, particularly over the hill singers, who remember the glory days and haven't stayed in shape will sing with an intensity level that they used to be able to handle and no longer can handle and the end result of it is a vibrato that is quite uncontrolled and wobbly. You know, the, the church choir soprano syndrome where some great singer some year back and now she's in her late 60s and she's feeling really like her glory days are back and, and they are not back. She did, but, yeah, pardon? Tony Bennett, he was very disappointing in his last performance. Because he had sort of gone past where he had any control. Tony Bennett happened to have been for a very long period of time one of these guys who sang with very little intensity. People who use microphones don't have to sing with the same degree of intensity that people who don't use microphones require. But nevertheless, he, for many years, clear up into his 60s, was still singing very smoothly and elegantly, but over the time it, it starts to take its toll. Okay, we answer vibrato? Um, put your thumb right here in the same place that you were. Now, sing, uh, I'm going to ask you to do this if you can. I want you to sing with a vibrato. I'll let my hand go like this when I want vibrato, shake it back and forth. When I make my hand go straight, I want you to make a straight tone. Uh, take your thumbs away. Uh, we're going to do this exercise and then we'll come back at it again. So here's vibrato. Okay, you answer me. What did you do? What did you do to make it go straight? Anybody? Relaxed. We did more relaxing. Oh, here's one that says relaxed, and here's someone that says tightened up. Yeah, that's a very interesting notion, isn't it? got different perceptions of what's really going on there. How many of you felt like you had, in order to get to go the, the tone straight, you had to hold it, had to control it? Mm -hmm. How many of you felt like you, in order to, to get the vibrato to happen, you had to let go? Some of you. Nobody wants to answer. And we're still in the post-lunch syndrome. No, Did you have something to say? I have a, a vibrato of sorts. It only ever happens whenever I hold long notes. I always thought it was a cause of running out of air. It's not something I ever thought I could control. Well, now you know better. <laughs> <laughs> but does it have anything to do with airflow? Yeah, sure does. Uh, if you have too little airflow, your vibrato will get wider and slower. And if you have more airflow, it'll move faster and the pitch won't undulate quite so much. Why? Because the vocal folds aren't under, aren't under such pressure. When it's aerodynamically produced, there's great ease in the larynx, relatively, 
when there's too little air, there's more compression there, there's greater work being done, and therefore the vibrato will be more prominent. Yes? I have a question. Uh, at one time I was a heavy smoker, and uh, I, at the time I thought I had a, a long voice range. I could go way up and i come way down. So I quit smoking and I started jogging at the same time. And since then I felt my voice range has always been compressed. I could not go as high as could not go as low. Is there any truth to that or is it in my head? <coughs> well, the answer to that question is, is that the, the hard, harmful thing for you was the smoking. Not just because of what it did to your lungs, but because what it did to the mucosal membrane. Just think of your vocal folds as being an oasis. And every time you took a puff on a cigarette, having a desert, dry desert wind blow first one direction and then the other direction back across it. Pretty soon you see that um, it evaporates. You know, and there's a lot of evaporation that goes on in the vocal tract that if you don't have plenty of hydration, you'll lose. If you have a sufficiency of hydration, if um, you have ceased smoking and removed any of the carcinogens from in and around your throat, one would assume that your vocal folds would be more healthy, more able to stretch. And so the fact that when you smoked, you had more range than you currently have would probably be owing to something else. Um, it might be coincidental, but I don't think that they're related to each other. The fact that you started jogging, um, so you'd have to be doing something unusual for the jogging to limit your voice range. Something about the way that um, you run, it may not have to do anything with that. It may have been, when was this that you did so? It's been about 20 years ago. And if I may ask, how old are you now? 63. Okay, so in your 40s was when this happened. So you had a pretty good voice range up through your mid-30s. Somewhere between 35 and 45, your voice range deteriorated. That's an, that may be doing to, owing to some other elements altogether. Um, the human voice, the adult voice, goes through some changes uh, right about age 35 to 45. And it's right about that point that a number of people who were quite good singers in their youth... Uh, somehow find it more difficult to sing and um, there is a, that some of, sometime owing to some medical conditions uh, do you have arthritis at all okay that wouldn't be it that's, that's a common occurrence because those who suffer from arthritis there are actually some joints in your larynx where the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage meet and just as the joints stiffen up with arthritis elsewhere they can stiffen up there and as soon as the thyroid cartilage can no longer tip on the cricoid cartilage, which is the means by which pitch is changed, then pitch uh, starts to drop off. There are some other explanations as well, but I, um, that, that uh, history that you give to me doesn't, they, the pieces don't add up right to me. Yeah. Okay, did, did, we, did I give you a satisfactory answer about vibrato? <clears throat> You're saying, what do I do if I have too much vibrato? Anybody feel that way? then I'm not going to bother to answer the question. What, if, what do I do if I don't have any vibrato when I want it? Anybody? One. We'll talk afterwards. Okay, so I won't take time to answer questions that aren't for everybody. When you normally talk, just in talking, are you normally talking within your breath uh, threshold? threshold? That would be the first question. The second one, if you're just normal singing, would you expect to have zero, little bit, or more vibrato, or is just under a normal singing voice. Gentle singing would probably have less vibrato. More dramatic singing would have more vibrato, and it would be expected to be so. So since for a vast majority of my life I sang dramatically, operatically, and for musical theater, you would expect that my vibrato would be more conditioned to be bigger than if I had spent my life as I started out to be. I started out to be a, a folk singer. You know, I came up during the time of Peter, Paul, and Mary. I played in a folk trio early on. Uh, did a little bit of jazz, played a saxophone before I got into classical music and played saxophone and sang in a jazz dance band and that sort of thing. And uh, at that time, my vibrato was more uh, narrow, less involved. So you, you can kind of get yourself conditioned uh, to, to that. So you listen to somebody like Andy Williams, who's had a very long career. He has a vibrato, but it's a very subtle background kind of thing. Um, then you listen to Liza Minnelli, and all she is is vibrato, you know, because, but she's a really dramatic person. Okay, so 
I think we've only got the one question about how to get vibrato if you want it, and we'll talk afterwards if we have a moment. Okay, the other questions that are happening. I've got one more general topic I want to try to get through, which is to how to color your voice, but we'll answer questions as we go. Earlier, you, that you were talking about damaging your voice, and you didn't go back to talk about that. What do you do if you if you do damage your voice? If you damage your voice, how do you know? Because it won't work anymore. Well. <laughs> yeah, there. The, uh, medical science can sometimes diagnose, but even sometimes you go to the doctor. You have voice trouble. They look and say, "No, your vocal cords look just fine. I don't see any damage there." Um, and that's probably a function of singing incorrectly. That in the moment of singing you do something that you ought not to do. But there are damages that occur. One of them is to get a blister on your vocal folds. That's called a polyp or a node. And that's a, like a callus that you get on your foot. And uh, those can go away uh, with proper treatment and rest or they can be taken out surgically. Uh, the, the dangers of surgery are much less than they used to be because they have the ability to do microsurgery now with laser beams and not without scalpels. And so the danger of some doctor having a twitch and cutting your vocal folds in two is just almost non-existent now. They can, they can get down to where they can decide whether to take out one cell or not to take it out. I mean, they're down on that level now. Uh, what, can you explain the difference between singing through your mouth and through your throat where you get the, the deeper sound? Like I think Elvis Presley through his career changed from one to the other, didn't he not? He did, but he was a remarkable singer. No, untrained, but he was a remarkable singer because he had so many different qualities to his voice. And that's the, the subject that I want to try to address before we run out of time today is how do you get different qualities in your voice? Everybody here knows who Burl Maine was. He died about 11 years ago from cancer of the throat. He was calling 30 and 40 dances a week during the winter time. Could you talk just a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, can can call can Colin be dangerous to your health? You get throat cancer from that? Throat cancer? No, I don't think so. Although um, I don't I don't really think any medical doctor really knows what causes cancer. But um, generally, um, the abusive situation the only thing that it does is wet, weaken the flesh and make it susceptible to something bad happening. Okay, should we talk about voice quality now? There are a variety of ways that you can tune your vocal track to make different kinds of sounds. Basically, if you either smile or raise your larynx, you can create a shorter vocal track and make a brighter sound. So, country western singers, they'll raise their vocal track and they'll make it real small and narrow so that it doesn't get very much sound behind the tongue. And you get a sound that's quite twangy, and it's a, it's a color choice. Anybody that's listened to Willie Nelson sing knows exactly what I'm talking about. And there's a dialect that goes along with that. And the dialect is simply born out of the fact that certain parts of the tongue are held stiff and rigid, and therefore you can't access the sounds that would normally be available to you because of it. Okay? Or you can let go of that. You hear me just let go of it? And all of a sudden the quality of the cha sound changes. If you look, at your, as you, uh, you look at your vocal tract, it's just a tube. It's about an inch and a quarter round. It starts at the top of your trachea and goes up into your mouth, comes out at the front end of your mouth. It's not really a tube, but it's about that same shape. Inside your mouth, it changes a whole bunch. <coughs> you can shorten it and brighten it. Or you can play Gomer Pyle and lower it. You know Jim Neighbors when he, there's, there's old Gomer Pyle who talks like this and then he sings like this. All he's done is he's learned to raise and lower his larynx a little bit and length, lengthen or shorten his, the length of his vocal tract. You let your larynx sit down low kind of like you're in the ready to get to yawn. You get that kind of a quality. It sounds um, like you just dropped about 50 points off your IQ. <laughs> and um and then you raise your larynx, and it also takes about 50 points off your height. <laughs> so that's, that's one way that people legi legitimately change the colors of their voices. And in essence, that's what uh, Elvis did. When he was singing down low in his range, he let his larynx all just hang out uh, at a nice at-rest position. But then when he got up into the high part of his voice, 
he just raised that larynx up and made this kind of a sound and he got way you all, you all of you heard Elvis you could see that he could get up and he could belt it out with the best of them in that high range so it isn't whether or not it is um, healthy or unhealthy high larynx low larynx is immaterial truly if you learn how to do it right you can sing with a high larynx and do it for a long time you can sing with a low larynx do it a long time the the usual advisable place for your larynx is to be is right where it should be not high not low just left alone shouldn't rise shouldn't lower as you go up a scale you shouldn't be able to see your larynx climbing up into your throat and as you go down low you shouldn't see your larynx drop down low because the pitch is changed inside the larynx not by changing the position of the larynx okay so but that's one way that you can you can change the quality of your voice by lengthening or shortening the the tube the other thing that you can do to make the sound darker is just to flute your lips out and make it a little longer. So watch. You hear the quality change? That's just the lengthening and shortening of the vocal tract. It's not, not a very big deal, but when you hear it put side by side, you say, hmm, that's interesting. Now, the other thing that you can do, yes? How, how wide your mouth is open. That's the next thing I was coming to. There are some other movable parts that make a difference. And it all depends on what kind of quality you want. You have one chamber that you can, you can kind of tune up for. It's inside your mouth. You've got another chamber that's behind your tongue at the upper part of your throat. Most popular singers don't use that space behind their tongue. That space behind your tongue is called the oral pharynx. The space inside your mouth is called the bucopharynx. And for the people who are going to sing popularly, that is, y'all, you don't necessarily want to get that big, deep, rich sound. Oh, every once in a while it's kind of nice for a, a piece or if your personality calls for it. But basically, you don't try to cultivate that. Here's how you can train yourself to work on that. Would all of you take your hands? We're going to make a little megaphone with our hands. You're going to put the top of the megaphone at the tip of your nose and put your thumbs right down at your chin. Let your thumb knuckles be right at the edge of your mouth. Okay, now, that this is the imagination. That that's all the space that you got to vibrate in. I'm going to demonstrate, and then I want you to do it. Here, If I don't let the sound change, here's what it sounds like. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Can you do that? One, two, three, four, five. See that's very bright and very it's hard to understand me. I have a speech impediment because many of the vowels don't belong there. They have to sit back deeper inside my mouth in order to be intelligible. I sound a little bit like Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> but it's just a caricature. It's very, 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 very fair forward in my mouth. Oh, it sounds kind of Canadian, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. That's the, that's the number one position. Way, 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 period. And it doesn't matter whether I'm talking to you in my voice or he in my voice. The resonance pattern is still very compressed forward. Nobody uses that except to make jokes. You know, it's a caricature. The second position is right across the bridge of your nose, down across your frown lines to the corners of your mouth, and it allows a little bit of vibration space right in behind your front teeth. Would you count to five in that place? One, two, three, four, five. Or, one, two, three, four, five. Now listen to when I do that. One, two, three, four, five. What do you get? Kind of bright. It's got a lot of twang in it. It's a lot of forwardness to it. Okay, third position. Right at the edge of your eye sockets. Imagine the line coming right straight down your cheekbones, sort of cutting across the inside of your mouth just in front of your molars. So now... You can allow the front part of your mouth to vibrate, but not back. Count to five. One, two, three, four, five. The O of four doesn't really belong there. At four, it's hard to say in a one and a two, because it's normally used to sitting deep and inside. Three is easy, because it's got a lot of forward quality to it. Now put it right back at your jaw hinge. Bring it down your jawline, and now you can imagine inside your mouth that you can let resonance happen clear back to the back part of your molars. Right, not, not behind your ear, right here, right at the hinge of your jaw, right there. 
Okay? Count to five. One, two, three, four, five. I can tell just by the way you're making those sounds that that's where most of you talk all of the time. That's the normal American dark place for people to talk. Um, and then put your fingers now behind your ears. This is the Gover Pile or the Forrest Gump voice. One, two, three, four, five. And you notice you have to really work to hold it there in the same way that you had to work to hold it right up there. That's really unusual. This is really unusual. And both of them are just caricatures. They're just sort of defining on opposite ends of the spectrum. Now listen. I'm going to do. I'm going to count to five in those five different placements on the same pitch, and you listen to the difference in the quality of the voice. <coughs> Thank you. One, two, three, four, five. 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 Same pitch. Different qualities, right? You get you can do that same thing. Join me. Here's one. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. 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 Oh, you all feel right at home right there. <laughs> you all have control of those five different places and you can theoretically sing any pitch in your range on any one of those five placements. To figure out how to do it, anybody figure out how you made those changes? You imitated me and I know how to do it, but did you figure it out? You can actually change where your voice comes out. But what tool do you use to do that? Here's your throat muscle. Well, more specifically, new, 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 yeah, your tongue. Yeah. That's right. He's back in the five place and I couldn't hear him. That is correct. It is your tongue. Go to that, that one position again. Watch how far forward you have your jammed, your tongue jammed up in your mouth. One, two, three, four, five. Tongue's way, way up there. Now go back to the five. One, two, three, four. See where your tongue is? You have control over that. The idealized place to be is a three. With those each have names to them. The, the one is, is called pinched, bright, pinched. The two is called bright and clear. Three is round and full. Four is round and dark and five is throaty or swallowed they each have a name and that and they get that name because that's what it sounds like you have the absolute ability to do that and why i advocate for you to sing in a three position is because well shoot who wants to sing in a one who would ever want to sing in a one who would want to sing in a five but let's say that you're singing a four all the time all you can do is make your voice brighter you can only move it forward because you move backward. You're in that five that nobody wants to hear. If you're in a two and that's your normal place to be, all you can do is make it darker. But if you're in a three, on occasion you can choose to bring it forward, make it brighter. You can choose to make it richer and fuller. You can kind of swing back and forth across that spectrum. And it's the most resonance balanced. I got one more. How are we doing time-wise? I got one more thing. Say what? Okay. Uh, that'll be just about enough time. Um, I got my thought here. The um, the balanced one that has both uh, the, the the three positions. What I'm trying to say that has brightness in it and also has richness in it gives you the ability to kind of go back and forward as you will, much in the same way that the mixed voice that I was talking about in the earlier part of the hour gives you ability to go up high and drop down low. Whereas if you stay in the low voice, it's hard to get to the high. Or if you stay in the high, it's hard to get to the low. But the mix has both of them in them and you can get there. That's why the three in terms of resonance is also the best. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about is, is to create a certain quality of command in your voice. This is called primal sound, the, the name that I'm talking about. And it is the sound that a baby makes when it cries. 
not the kind of not the kind of sound that a six or an eighth month makes when he knows how to manipulate, but the innocent baby cry of a newborn baby. Incidentally, you might be interested to know that the vocal tract, the length of the vocal tract of a newborn baby, is approximately the same length as the uh, as the um, um, hearing tract of a female. Hence, that's why women can hear babies cry better than men can. <laughs> it's not our fault. We just aren't tuned to it. <laughs> Doesn't it make you wonder about all the rest of the stuff I've been saying today? <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> um, but there is a sound, a very natural sound, that comes out of a baby's throat that is enormously efficient that somehow over the next 20 years of our lives becomes progressively less efficient. And um, there are people who cultivate that sound in their speaking. I'm actually cultivating it right now as a way of preserving my voice because my voice is getting tired. But by, by tracking that quality, you can, I can make my voice carry more readily. You'll notice that I'm, I'm, I'm not on microphone now. I'm just, it's for recording purposes only. But it, the sound is a little bit on the raw side when you first discover it. I'll show it to you. Ah, 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 ah. That's the quality. That sound right there has an enormous amount of command in it. Who cultivates that sound? Um, people who sell newspapers on street corners. Why? Because they can't shout over the top of the noise, but they can tune their resonance tract to give a brilliancy to their sound that will penetrate through the noise. Who else cultivates that sound? Drill sergeants have that sound to command. Otherwise, they end up with laryngitis before half the day is over because of the compression, the pressure in their voices. So they get that commanding quality in their voice. Who else does it? Auctioneers. Auctioneers, definitely. Auctioneers have that sound. Radio announcers, I don't know if you've ever, especially spokespeople, people who, when they talk, they want you to believe them and respond to them that Crest Toothpaste is better than Colgate. And it isn't the words that they say, it's the choice of the sound that they produce. Now, who else ought to be cultivating that sound? Square dance callers definitely need that quality in their voice because it takes pressure off of the throat and it puts command into it. So if you're, <clears throat> if you were to say for me, count to five, now let's make it ten, can you hear the quality in my voice? Ah, ah, join me please. Ah, ah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, ten. And you can also do it up here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you can also do it down there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How did you do it? Comment to yourselves. How did you do it? Change the location of your tongue. Change the location of your tongue? Yes, but it's a little more subtle than that, but you're absolutely right. It's, the reason I'm not letting that answer stand all by itself is because that's probably not how you sensed it. Uh, he didn't want to say it this time, he just pointed. State of mind. It is a state of mind. It, has, it is a choice that you make. You dis we are all very discerning creatures and we can pitch our voices to do a variety of different tasks. We've had years of manipulative experience to do that. We know how to make our voices feel, Gee, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I'll never do it again. Please take me back. <laughs> to, I'll never forgive you for that. As, you know, you can, you, we can be angry with our voices. We can be gentle. We can be kind. We can be severe. 
And it isn't the words that we say, it's the tone of voice that we adopt. So we have many, yeah, we, we can be enthusiastic, we can be dull. Regardless of how smart or dumb we are, we can sound enthusiastic or we can sound bored. And, and it's a color, a quality in our voice. But that sound, that primal sound, this sound is partially related to the tongue, but it's also a sense that you feel inside yourself that you track. You can hear me. I'm tracking it right now. And it's not going away. Whereas now it's gone. You hear it go away? This is now my friendly voice. This is now my commanding voice. And they're not hard to tell the difference between. And if I say to you, did you know that a baby's um, vocal tract is about the same length as a woman's eustachian, or I don't know what to call it, the, the, the ear tract? If I use that voice, you're going to say, Gee, you know, I just learned something new. And if I say, did you know that? I say, yeah, right, come on. <laughs> but it is actually the truth. <laughs> but, but, what it, but just what it means, what it means is a court. <laughs> no, it's a literal, literal truth. It's just the application that becomes important. We're absolved. We're absolved after all of these years. To me, it always means how far do you want to project? To the last square? Or do you just want to talk to the front? Or do you want to talk to the last ones with your, your mind? You're exactly right. When you pointed to your mind, he is, ab he is absolutely correct about it. How we conceive it is how we will do it. And if we don't conceive it, you won't do it. If you can't make it happen in your mind you won't be able to make it happen in your voice. Now, I'm overstating that because, for example, if I were your voice teacher and I could conceive it, then I could help you get someplace that you'd never been before, perhaps. But if you can conceive it, if you can conceive your ability to sing a high note, a loud note, a, a low note, a quiet note, if you, in your mind you can see how your body can do it, then your body can do it. But if your mind can't see it, your body can't do it. Okay, a while ago you gave us some exercises to help us improve our bre breathing. Are there any uh, exercises that we can use to improve our voice quality? The exercise that we just did, that five placement, is one that you can play. And it's, uh, it's really fun. If you finally learn how to do it, you can make all kinds of people laugh. You know, even get it, you get up there and doing a tip, and every once in a while you just kind of flip over into a number one position. That'll get their attention right off the bat, <laughs> particularly if you have a funny song. If you want, yeah. I knew, a, I knew an opera singer who learned how to sing notes and say S's and whistle at the same time. You know, I can't do it, but it was... And he used that as a, every time he had character parts on the stage, he could whistle every time he said an S. And it was hilarious. It was just a gag, <clears throat> but it gave him one more tool that he could use to have people hire him to work. <coughs> so the, the placement paradigm is the other one. The thing I haven't answered is what about the opening and closing of the mouth? And that has everything to do with whether you want the space, the sound to be here or in the back. You'll be startled to know that when you open your mouth wider, the space in your throat gets smaller. And that when you close your mouth up, the space in your throat gets bigger. So since most of you would prefer to have the sound in your mouth, the um, then you would, would think that you would want to open your mouth wider so that the sound would stay here. Imagine that your tongue coming up out of your throat has an arch to it. And you want your resonances to sit in the downward slope in front of your tongue, not the downward slope sliding back down your throat. And so if you can think of that there and open your mouth, you'll be startled at how much more um, resonant your voices will be. Exercises, counting to five, doing any kind of limerick poem, anything that you want to, but actually touching those spots on your face until internally you can discern the difference between them is going to be really helpful to you. And you'll discover, today I'm going to sing this song in a two position. Then I'm going to go back and I'm going to sing it in a three position. Can I tell the difference between them? Which one, does that, which one sounds better? I can actually control the quality. Do I want this song to be brighter, more commanding, or do I want it to be a little more mellow? You can actually very much consciously control that.